Welcome to the PA Books Podcast. PA Books is a production of PCN, the Pennsylvania Cable Network. This program features interviews with authors of books on Pennsylvania people, history, sports, business, nature, and politics. We hope you enjoy this podcast. This is PA Books, featuring authors of books about Pennsylvania's people, politics, history, and business. This week, Walter Isaacson discusses his book, Benjamin Franklin, An American Life. Walter Isaacson, author of Benjamin Franklin, An American Life. What was it about Benjamin Franklin that made you want to sit down and write a biography of him? You know, he's the most human of all of the founders. He's the guy we can really relate to, made of flesh and blood, tells wonderful stories about himself, very self-aware. If you look at Washington or Adams or even Jefferson, they're somewhat intimidating. Uh, even the people of the Constitutional Convention here in Philadelphia found them so. But Franklin is the genial one. Also, we see our virtues, our values, and our human frailties and flaws all reflected in Franklin. And especially at this time, when he helped give us the notion of a religious tolerance, of a pluralism, uh, and those are the virtues and values we need in a pretty fractured world these days. I just felt uh, the more we could know about Franklin and the more each generation and each new writer could relate to Franklin, it would be fun and it would be perhaps a bit useful, as he would say. There are so many different facets yeah. to Franklin. Is there one particular favorite you have, journalist, inventor, yeah. politician? Well, clearly a media guy because I spent so much time in the media. And the way he built a media empire, starting on Market Street here and you know having a print shop and then deciding he needed some great content. He gets the Pennsylvania Gazette and then a magazine, you know, he wants to form and then in order, as, his, as the preface to Poor Richard's Almanac says, uh, his wife was threatening to throw him out of the house if he didn't make a little bit more money, so he gets Poor Richard's Almanac and soon he's franchising print, shop, print shops up and down the coast from Boston down to the Carolinas, you know, with his friends and relatives. And then when he has these, this sort of content and printing facilities, he creates a great distribution network, uh, the way a modern media tycoon might try to do with the American postal system. So that fascinated me. But also, I first became fascinated with his diplomacy, because I'd been writing about American foreign policy, being involved in it, and done a book on Henry Kissinger. And I wanted to see the roots of realism in American foreign policy. Here's the best diplomat we ever had, plays a brilliant balance of power game with France, the Bourbon Pact nations like uh, Spain, and then the Netherlands, Flanders against Britain and stuff. But he also realizes that it's our ideals, our values, the sort of love of liberty and freedom that America stands for that will be the great source and attract people to want to be on our side. That's a lesson we could use today as well. Was he an effective diplomat? I mean, was, oh, yeah, he was when great. When he was in France, was he able to persuade the French to join us, or did they do that just... Oh, I think he was win. instrumental in persuading the French to join us. The French, it was somewhat in their interest to do so, but also they had had quite a few wars over the past 400 years with Britain. They had finally enjoyed peace. Their treasury was not doing so well. Uh, there was a great pressure within uh, the King Louis XVI's cabinet uh, especially by Turgot, the finance minister, not to get involved in another crisis. Franklin not only gives Verjean, the French foreign minister, a brilliant balance of power memo that describes why it may be in their interest to do so, but then he retreats a bit and builds himself a printing press in Paris and uh, publishes the Declaration of Independence, the Constitution of Pennsylvania, all these inspiring documents that had come out of America in the 1770s. And he wants to inspire the French to be on our side as a population. And he wanders around in his fur cap, even though he was a Market Street guy. He was not exactly a frontiersman. But he knows the French, you know, like this idea of Rousseau's natural man. So he's there pretending to be the frontier philosopher. And he's the most popular person in France. Everybody's wearing little medallions of Franklin. Uh, even the women. And the women are wearing coiffure a la Franklin, which is to make their hair look like the fur cap. Uh, the king was so amused by it that there was a countess in his court who was always talking about Franklin and wearing the medallion that he made a porcelain chamber pot for her with a Franklin medallion on the bottom for her to use. But uh, in the end, the French people and the French ministry and Verjean all come together and uh, Franklin's able to negotiate the Treaty of Alliance and friendships. And uh, I think it's instrumental in us winning the war. They've supplied, I think, 90% of the gunpowder for America. 
Uh, Franklin recruited Lafayette, and he has more troops at Yorktown, the decisive battle, than Washington has American troops, and Admiral Lagasse is blockading the coast. Uh, I think Franklin was the last diplomat we had who quite knew how to deal with the French. They're kind of hard to deal with these days. How many transatlantic trips did he take? Oh, that's a good life. question. I should try to remember. He does it at age 17. He goes to England uh, as the envoy of uh, the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania and then comes back and then goes back to England again, returns in 1775, goes to France in late 1776, and returns after about 10 years there to be at the Constitutional Convention. So, so a lot more crossings than uh, most people made in this 18th century. He was crossing the ocean when he was pretty old. Yeah, he was crossing the ocean at age 17 where he first did his little experiments on the Gulf Stream and he comes back in, uh, when he's almost 80 years old. So, uh, and these were not easy trips. It's not quite like uh, the uh, Concord. When uh, he always considered, until fairly late in the, the uh, Revolutionary War era, he considered himself an Englishman and a British subject sure. and was proud of that. Was there ever a time when you found that he thought about just staying in England? And why didn't oh, he stay yeah. in England? Oh, yeah. Well, uh, the question sometimes is why did he stay in England so long, not why didn't he return home? I mean, why didn't he stay there forever? Uh, Franklin is torn. Franklin always believes you can find common ground, that there's a good accommodation you can make uh, and uh, perhaps share certain values. He, he referred to the English Empire, the British Empire, as a noble China vase that once it became broken, there was no way to put it back together. So throughout the early 1770s, even as late as uh, 1774, he really hopes that he can negotiate some accommodation. Uh, it's not until seven, he's been humiliated and he finally comes back in 1775, uh, has a summit meeting with his son, his son who he adored, the illegitimate son, William, who had become loyalist, Tory, the royal governor of New Jersey, and they begun drifting apart because of William's aristocratic and loyalist tendencies. They have a summit meeting up in Bucks County, and uh, Franklin declares that he's going to be for independence. William stays loyal to the crown, and it's a personal as well as political split after that. Is there a moment in Franklin's life that the decision is made that he's for independence? Yes and no. I mean, he's humiliated in what's called the cockpit, right around Parliament, where He's uh, brought before them to testify about some letters that he had allowed to become public. And that humiliation is so bad he doesn't say a word. He's wearing this old Manchester coat of velvet. And uh, after that, it's almost impossible for him to conceive that uh, there won't be a war of independence. But even so, right near the end, as he's preparing to come back home, he meets with Admiral Howe and his Lord Howe and his sister playing chess, and they talk about the possibility uh, of reaching some accommodation. Uh, certainly the, uh, the Whigs were hoping for that as opposed to the Tories who were then in power. And even after the Declaration of Independence, when Admiral Howe comes to America uh, commanding the British troops, uh, he brings a peace feeler. And Franklin and John Adams together come from Philadelphia to meet with Admiral Howe on Staten Island to see if it's possible that this peace deal will work. Adams was much more of a staunch rebel. He was a little bit worried that Franklin would make a compromise, so they traveled together. And by the way, when they get to uh, New Jersey on their way to uh, Staten Island, there's only one room left in the end, and they have to share a bed, which is one of these great scenes we as who love the colonial period uh, always relish. And they share a bed, and John Adams has this cold. And Franklin, the great scientist, has just come up with his theory, which turned out to be true, of the contagious nature of colds, that they're caused by germs or microbes as opposed to by cold air. So he wants to keep the windows open the whole time they're sleeping together in this bed. And Adams, who's got a cold, wants to shut the windows. He's cold and miserable. And Franklin says, well, I have to explain to you my theory of the contagious nature of colds. And Adams, who's usually not that funny in his diaries, very wryly notes that after half an hour, Franklin was droning on and on, and I got bored and fell asleep, and thus Franklin won the argument. You think of Adams and Franklin as having two very different personalities. Adams kind of mm -hmm. the, the stereotypical New Englander, and yet Franklin was from New England. Well, Franklin was from New England like uh, Adams, but he runs away. He runs away because he hates that sort of puritanical 
uh, mindset and even the, the doctrines of the Puritans that salvation comes through grace alone and being part of God's elect as opposed to salvation through good works, which was sort of his creed when he comes to Philadelphia. He's also much more tolerant, even as a 15-year-old writing under a pseudonym in Boston as silence do good. He's making fun of the connection between church and state and of Governor Dudley, who went from the ministry uh, to the government. And uh, so Franklin uh, runs away from and rejects that sort of uh, uh, Boston Puritan approach. And Adams uh, pretty much is influenced by it much more and remains more faithful to that creed. And so they had different personalities. And, you know, if you read David McCullough's absolutely wonderful book on John Adams, you see the struggles, the personal struggles between these two men. But as McCullough points out, and as I try to dwell on too, these are real human beings, and they're not true enemies, even though they rub each other the wrong way at times and fight. They're both patriots. They both strongly believe in certain things. They come to admire each other. By the time they're finished together in Paris and negotiating the treaty with England, they're working together hand in glove, and Adams becomes much more admiring of Franklin. And the best assessment of Franklin, very favorable, although nuanced, comes right after Frank or comes after Franklin dies and John Adams writes about him and you know reconsiders his views on Franklin. How did Franklin and Thomas Jefferson get along? Oh, Franklin and Jefferson were very close. Jefferson's much younger, about 40 years younger. But they're both emblems and leaders of the Enlightenment in America, sort of a believer in deism, which is the religious creed that, uh, you know, a belief in God, but without much dogma or much sectarian, you know, received wisdom, just that there was a creator of the universe. And that most of what we do should be guided by reason and rationality. It was called the age of reason, an experiment as opposed to uh, faith or, you know, fundamentalism. And so Franklin and Jefferson adore each other. Franklin, as I said, has some problems with Adams in Paris. So when, Frank, uh, so when Jefferson comes over to join them, Franklin's ecstatic because uh, uh, Jefferson uh, praises him, worships him, plays chess with him, goes to visit all the ladies and girlfriends in Paris that Franklin has. And they're really you know, almost like a father-son relationship. The last letter Franklin ever writes is a wonderful letter to Thomas Jefferson. And in fact, when Jefferson uh, here on Market Street wrote the first draft of the Declaration of Independence, he was on a committee with Adams and Franklin, among others. And Franklin was sort of the editor. And so Jefferson sends it down the street to Franklin. And in this beautiful flowery letter says, will the brilliant Dr. Franklin be so kind as to perhaps offer any suggestion that can improve it? And as an old editor, I was thinking people were much kinder to editors way back then. <laughs> uh, and Franklin sort of famously changes, um, and I have a picture of it in my book, because that first draft is a wonderful document. It's, it's in the basement of the Library of Congress. They should have it on display all the time. But I have a picture of it in my book in which it, it shows uh, the great second paragraph in which Jefferson has written, we hold these truths to be sacred and undeniable. And with that old printer's pen that Benjamin Franklin had, he does heavy backslashes and rewrites it to, we hold these truths to be self-evident, which was sort of a phrase of the Enlightenment, that we understood our rights by, by the basis of rationality and reason as opposed to being received from God. How do you get along with George Washington? Well, he knew Washington early on and, like everybody, revered Washington. Washington was a great and noble figure. And when Washington is merely a fledgling colonel in the militia coming up from Virginia to help fight the frontier wars in Pennsylvania, there's Franklin helping to raise money for his troops and helping him out, becoming friends with him. And in 1775 and 76, that horrible winter, Franklin goes up to Cambridge, Massachusetts, where Washington's troops are quartered uh, because he's a delegate of the Congress to help Washington uh, raise the money and restore discipline to his army. But I think Franklin, who is a humorous, very flesh and blood type of character, felt that, uh, as we do today, that Washington was sort of carved in marble and somewhat intimidating and unapproachable. There's one point in the Constitutional Convention where a group of the more uh, merry uh, delegates, including Franklin and Governor Morris, uh, are joking about Washington being so austere, and they bet Morris that he won't go slap Washington on the back and say, how are things going today, General? And they bet him the price of a dinner that he won't do it. 
So Morris does it, and then he comes back and reports to Franklin and others, not for the price of a thousand dinners, would ever do that again, <laughs> given the look he just gave me. <laughs> uh, Franklin did not get along with everyone. Sure. You write about his relations with the Penn family, the sons of William Penn, and you have Governor John Penn. He's William Penn's son? Mm -hmm. Or nephew, I'm sorry. Yeah, Governor yeah, John yeah. Penn wrote of Franklin, there will never be any prospect of ease and happiness while that villain has the liberty of spreading about the poison of that inveterate malice and ill nature which is deeply implanted in his own black heart. He called Franklin Strong. a tribune of the people and that he was a danger because he believed in democracy. And it was all so true because Franklin was a tribune <laughs> of the people. Franklin's first foray into politics was as an opponent of the Penn family's policies of taxation. And it was a very early struggle in the revolution, in the uh, colonial era, because the Penn family, who were the proprietors of Pennsylvania, or virtually the owners of much of the land in Pennsylvania, and ruled Pennsylvania, instead of being directly ruled by the king, the Penn family, as you know, were the proprietors. And they imposed a certain form of taxation in which all of their lands and all of their property were exempt from taxation. And Franklin bristled at that. And it wasn't just, it was a matter of fairness, of course, but not just that. Franklin was a, a member of this sort of fledgling middle class, we the middling people, he called it in Philadelphia. And they were sort of opposed to the higher born aristocracy that was trying to rule with a class system in Pennsylvania the way there was a class system and aristocracy and nobility back in England. So it was an early on struggle. I think Franklin tried for a while to get along with the Pens. There is a moment when the Paxton Boy massacres occurred and the frontiersmen are coming into Philadelphia and there's a real struggle going on and Governor Penn all of a sudden is depending on Franklin and runs to his house for advice and they work together. But they kept splitting over this issue of taxation. In fact, the reason Franklin goes to London is to lobby against the Penn family and try to make it so that Pennsylvania becomes a royal colony. Because Franklin, till near the very end, was always loyal to the king. He felt that the problems were caused either by the bad ministers of the Tory party or by the Penn family who was imposing unfair taxes, tax policies. How did he do in England with that mission? Not very well. I mean, as you know how it turns out, we have a revolution. We, so his uh, quest to prevent the revolution failed. So the Penn family kept the proprietorship? They Absolutely. The, the Penn the family, there was no, it was a somewhat quixotic, perhaps even misguided attempt by Franklin to wrest control of the colonies away from the Penn family. Was that an unusual setup in the colonies for a family or a person to own, no. essentially own the colonies? There were, uh, of the 13 colonies, there were some that were pure royal colonies. Uh, there were some that were chartered by uh, trading companies, like the Commonwealth of Massachusetts was a Massachusetts Bay Company was the original charter. Um, but especially in the middle and northern middle colonies, you had often proprietary colonies. Maryland was a proprietary colony, Delaware, uh, Pennsylvania. I think New York had been a proprietary colony uh, with the brother of the king uh, as the proprietor, James, but then he becomes king, so it turns into a royal colony. So there was always that little struggle of how are the colonies governed. You have to remember, nobody really thought of America in the 1750s as one nation or one place. It was many different settlements and plantations, each governed differently with uh, different uh, formulas. Franklin was the very fir one of the very first Americans to understand America as America, to see it as potentially one unified nation, partly because he had created the postal system and traveled from Boston down to the Carolinas, uh, had print shops everywhere, so well traveled that he, he understood that there was a common interest among all of the colonies, and he kept insisting that if we stood together as colonies, we'd be stronger than if we stood apart. And as early as 1754, He's proposing the first federal system, a federal plan of unity for the colonies. How did he create the postal system? Well, there were post offices and postals, you know, a fledgling postal system already. There was a postmaster in Philadelphia and one in Boston. They had some contacts. Franklin, when he came to Philadelphia and started his printing shop in Empire, was not the postmaster. In fact, his rival was the postmaster. And uh, you were sort of at a disadvantage if your rival is a publisher and printer and newspaperman, 
was the postmaster because that person got to use the postal services more easily and got more news, got it quicker, could sort of control, unlike today where everything's open, could sort of, it's like the cable companies or the media companies today. If you own the pipeline, you kind of control what shows might go or what networks might go on the air. Well, it was a little bit that way back then. So Franklin tries very hard to become the postmaster in Philadelphia, the local postmaster. And he does, uh, eventually. He's able to take it away from, I think it was Bradford was the name, who was the postmaster at the time and the rival newspaper publisher at the time. So once he does that, um, he realizes that if you string them together, and here's what I was saying, he understood the unity of the colonies and he had brothers in Boston and Newport and other places and apprentices that he'd helped set up shop in, in New York and in the Carolinas. He had all these postal, he had all these print shops and publishers, and they each became postmasters, and he helped string them together. He would love to travel up and down the coast. He had a deputy, he had a uh, partner as a postmaster most of the time. But he would travel, go down to the Carolinas and Virginia and spend a lot of time inspecting the postal systems there and would travel then all the way up to Boston. He loved to travel, and I think that's one reason he helped form the Postal Service. I have to read one more quote you have in here about Franklin. Pennsylvania Chief Justice Allen labeled him the most unpopular and odious name in the province, delirious with rage, disappointment, and malice. Mm -hmm. If you had sat down with Franklin to have dinner with him, what would the experience have been like? He would not be enraged or full of malice. He obviously had um, a political struggle with the proprietary faction, as we said, the proprietors and their supporters, which included Allen at the time, and the more aristocratic and uh, uh, people who ran the colony. But he was a very gentle conversationalist. He believed that even when you disagreed with somebody, you should not confront them, you should not enter into arguments or disputes. In fact, some people found him annoying because he was so insinuating whenever he disagreed instead of arguing, you know, this was not crossfire or, you know, some cable show like that. It was, uh, he always engaged in these Socratic conversations where he'd ask questions and he'd feign in uh, innocence sometimes. He said, well, I don't quite understand. And, and so in his conversation, he almost called it an artifice of conversation, he was always congenial and gentle and questioning and um, very, he, he had a clubby form called the Junto. And one of the rules was you could never dispute with another member. You could only assert yourself by asking gentle questions and making gentle suggestions. And if you engaged in dispute, if you argued or contradicted directly another member, you were fined. And so I always thought at the Aspen Institute, where I am now, this is a great way we could raise money. If people are at our discussion groups and they start yelling at each other, we could find them. It also would be a good thing for our country now. I think there's a little bit too much of that um, partisan shouting. And even in the bookstores these days or on cable TV these days, everything is uh, calling each other, you know, liars or treason or whatever, slanderers or whatever it may be. And Franklin, even though he had problems with Justice Allen or the Governor Penn, uh, when he got to the tavern on the corner and they were drinking Madeira at night, he was the most genial and friendly of souls. What is the Aspen Institute? The Aspen Institute is something that was founded 50 years ago, very much like Franklin's Junto. It's a education and leadership group in which people come out to Aspen and anybody can come. Uh, anybody can sign up, just go to the website, to take the seminars on the great values that have informed our civilization, starting with Plato and Confucius and going through to Martin Luther King and the founders of our country. It's a week-long holiday or spa for the mind uh, that people have done for 50-some-odd years, ever since Mortimer Adler, Robert Maynard Hutchins, Walter Pepke, and Henry Luce and others formed it. So that's at the core of the Aspen Institute, and that's sort of the public thing that, you know, these are these small seminars, but people sign up for them, they come out to Aspen, and they do them. We also are like a traditional think tank. We have about 15 policy programs that look at everything from the environment to education to foreign policy and do studies, and we try to have those studies inform the way our seminars are in discussion of basic values to see if we can find common ground. It's not something that's supposed to be partisan. It's supposed to be the opposite of partisan and ideological, where you come together, 
and do readings and discussions together, do studies together, and see if there's a common ground on the issues. And finally, we have a leadership training program called the Henry Crown Fellowship Program that's, again, like something Franklin did for the uh, you know, apprentices and young tradesmen of Philadelphia, in which each year 20 people are selected who are great community or business leaders young around this country, and they would go through the Aspen program over a course of two years, spending one week uh, six times over the course of two years. And they do projects where they try to pay it forward. And so we've recreated these type of leadership programs around the world where people do the same sort of thing. And we have them in Botswana, Uganda, South Africa, Mozambique. We're opening in October in um, Costa Rica. They hope to do it in Beijing and New Delhi. So it's a long answer, but it's sort of an education, leadership institute, and think tank. And it's not very secretive. People sort of say, isn't it that? And I say, no, no, no. If you want to, you can go to the you know, aspeninstitute.org website and find out how to come to one of the seminars or be involved in one of the programs. And uh, I guess this summer we may have had, you know, six, seven hundred people coming through over the course of the summer, either for big conferences or for these uh, values seminars that we do. And you're the president? Yes. Mm -hmm. And that affords you the time to write uh, biographies of... Uh, well, I actually finished Franklin uh, earlier this year, right before I became president. How long did it take? It took 12 years, but it was a delightful 12 years. People sometimes say, how'd you find the time to do it? And, you know, people find the time to do what they really love, whether it's play golf or do jigsaw puzzles or make model boats or watch TV at night or whatever. And in the evenings, uh, I loved reading Benjamin Franklin. There's so much greater than, so much better, I think, than some of the other founders because his writing is so chatty and conversational. He's, you know, he writes with that uh, unaffected, direct, funny, humorous style. So for years, it was this great pleasure just to spend the evenings reading everything he wrote or that people wrote about him. And I was trying to connect this theme of the values he believed in and how those values helped inform what America became. Can you... Um Pick a moment in Franklin's life that you w would have loved to be dropped down in the middle of that you could have witnessed firsthand. I think the Constitutional Convention is the most glorious moment. In some ways, it brings a lot together. He's a scientist, and he's an old tradesman, so he believes in doing things in a practical way. He didn't have great ideologies when it came to his science. He would be an experimenter and say, well, this theory of electricity doesn't seem right. Let's test it this way. And he comes up with the single fluid theory of electricity. So he's pragmatic. It sort of helps found the idea of the pragmatic philosophy in America. So they get to the Constitutional Convention, and you know, here in Philadelphia, and as you know, there's a great struggle after a while. It's a very hot summer, and halfway through it looks like it's all going to fall apart. You have the people from the big states who want proportional representation. You have people from the smaller states who want each state represented equally. And the Connecticut people had tried to compromise, but that had failed. And everything was breaking down, and Franklin finally says, look, um, when I was a uh, young tradesman, we had to make a joint that would hold together, and it didn't quite fit. You'd shave a little from one side and take a little from the other side, and eventually you'd have a joint that would hold together for centuries. And so, too, we here at this convention must all part with some of our demands in order to make a constitution that's going to hold together. And he makes the motion that comes up with the compromise of having both a House and a Senate, and he says everybody should now step forward and make it unanimous. And there's this great closing speech he does in which he says, and he, you know, he's now hit 80 or so, and he's twice as old as the average age of all the other members combined. And he's saying, look, the older I get, the more I realize that sometimes I'm fallible, that I may have strong beliefs or strong principles, but as I grow older, I begin to doubt some of them and think, well, maybe the other people were right, and so too you must admit that you might be fallible and come together for this compromise. Because, and his point was, compromisers may not make great heroes, but they do make great democracies. And it was a beautiful moment, and they finally all line up, almost all of them, all except for a handful, to sign this document. Franklin points to the chair of General Washington. He says, I've often wondered whether carved on the back of that chair it was a rising or a setting sun. He said, but now I know it's a rising sun. And finally, they open the doors, they come out to the streets of Philadelphia. Mrs. Pownall, a great old matron of the uh, town, is there and says, what have you wrought, Dr. Franklin? You know, what, what have you brought us in there? And he says, a republic, madam, if you can keep it. And it was that faith that a democratic system could work if the people were willing to compromise, be tolerant, and believe in democracy. What was he like physically? He was a big guy. He was a swimmer ever since he was like 
eight or seven or eight years old, where he would be swimming in Boston Harbor. He invented flippers and fins and used a kite to pull himself across the harbor. He loved doing tricks in swimming. He would strip naked and uh, uh, be pulled across the harbor with a kite. And then when he goes to England as an 18, 19 year old uh, from Philadelphia, he goes over to England for the first time for a couple of years. And uh, he's with a group of friends sailing up the Thames River. And he sort of strips and jumps in the river and swims back and forth the bank. They had never really seen swimming that much. People were sort of skeptical swimming, of yeah, swimming did in not water. do, uh, was not exactly a sport normal people did back then. And one of them, whose family was wealthy, offered to set him up for a swimming school and stake him to it. And he decided finally to come back to Philadelphia. Uh, but so he was a strong guy. He carried uh, big, uh, you know, uh, carts of um, print, of, uh, you know, the fonts, the lead, and uh, he was, uh, you know, had broad shoulders. He was, I think he was close to six feet, and he was incredibly good-looking. Unfortunately, since he wasn't famous, he didn't come from a rich family, it's not until his 40s that you begin to have portraits painting of, painted of him. But the best portraits come even when he's much older, when he's in his 70s, and the women friends he has in Paris, Rosalie Philul and others, are painting pictures of him, and he looks, you know, very sexy and virile with his shirt pulled open and stuff. So uh, he was quite a ladies' man his entire life, and it's easy to see why. Uh, is there any recording, I mean, a written record of what his voice sounded like? No, except that he was not a great orator. He did not give flamboyant speeches. He did very rarely gave, you know, major speeches before a crowd. When he talked, he was very conversational, even when he talked at the convention. And by the end of his life, when he's at the uh, Continental Congress of the convention, most of the time he wrote his speeches out and gave them to somebody else to read because uh, he felt it was easier. Uh, and so, uh, but we do know his conversation. He wrote a wonderful essay called On Conversation, where it's almost a how to succeed in winning, winning friends and influencing people on the art of conversation, how to show interest in other people, how to take their ideas and incorporate them in your own, how not to be boring, that sort of thing. So we know he was a great conversationalist, but not a great orator. Where did he learn to write? Did he have a teacher anywhere along the way? No, you know, his dad it? was going to send him to Harvard because he was the 10th son. He was going to be the tithe to the Lord and go to the, into the ministry. Harvard then churned out ministers, unlike today. and. Um, but Franklin was not exactly cut for the cloth, and when he was a young kid, uh, they were salting away all the provisions for the winter one day, and he said to his father, uh, why don't I say grace right now, and we get it done with once and for all for the entire year. So his father said, it's a waste of money to send him to Harvard. Franklin still wants to be a writer, so he has to teach himself. And he's apprenticed to his brother James in the print shop in Boston, and he finds on the shelf The Spectator, this great British magazine with Addison and Steele, the two editors, the great essayists. And Franklin would pull down the volumes and read the essays and take notes. And then he would shuffle up his notes and put them aside and then come back a few days later and try to recreate the essay. And he would compare the essay that he had recreated with the original. And he would correct it where he had done as well. But as he records in his autobiography, every now and then, in some particular or maybe another, he would feel that perhaps he had matched or even ex exceeded the writing of the arguments of Addison and Steele, and that encouraged him into thinking he might become a tolerable writer. And so he became not only a tolerable writer, but by far the most popular writer in the colonies, the most conversational and direct. Now you have very literary writers of the time, Jonathan Edwards being the most notable, with the great poetic flourishes and stuff. Franklin was not as literary, but he was a more direct, conversational, popular, uh, in, you know, I think, uh, very persuasive writer, and in my mind, the best writer in colonial America. Who were Addison and Steele? Addison and Steele were the two great essays of uh, the early 1700s in England. They edited this, what was, became a famous, although short-lived, magazine called The Spectator. And uh, uh, they wrote, like Defoe and Swift and others, in a humorous, sometimes with satire, gentle satire style, slightly political, but always kind of amused. And it was that, those writers of the early British Enlightenment in London, you know, Swift and Defoe and Addison and Steele, that Franklin loved, and you can see them reflected in his style. You said earlier that you like sitting down and reading Franklin's writings. 
Uh, can you recommend something? If, after someone has finished reading your book, what of Franklin's should they sit down and read? Well, boy, that was a nice setup question, which you may not know, <laughs> which is it's hard to go into a bookstore these days and get all of his writings. You can buy the autobiography, you know, Penguin Paperback. It's a great book, and everybody should read it. But if you want to read those silent, do-good letters he wrote when he was 15 and 16 years old as a hoax, or you want to read the speech of the Constitutional Convention or the last letter to Jefferson or the whole autobiography and the, uh, you know, uh, hoaxes and parodies and the speech of Polly Baker and the witch trial at Mount Holly, all these wonderful stuff he wrote, it's hard to find them all anthologized, although the Library of America maybe 15, 20 years ago did a nice volume, but it's not really available in bookstores today. So in about a month, where the publisher that did my book were coming out with just a Benjamin Franklin reader, an anthology. Everything from the very first Silence Do Good letter to the parody he wrote on his deathbed attacking those defending slavery in America, which was a funny but brutal parody of those who defended slavery. And uh, I'd do a little introduction to each of the uh, pieces, and they sort of set it and put it in context. And I think it'll be pretty inexpensive. We're just sort of putting it out uh, as a nice anthology because a lot of people have read my book, and they praise Franklin, of course. And he's a great writer because I use a lot of Franklin in the book and quote from all of his wonderful pieces and his humor. And they say, you know, they'd love to read more. And so the best way to do it is to read Franklin himself. I have to read one of them. He, he used to write his own letters to the editor, to his papers, oh, yes, right. and then respond to them. And you have one, one letter from a reader, or from Franklin pretending to be a reader, posed the following dilemma. Suppose a person discovers that his wife has been seduced by his neighbor, and suppose he has reason to believe that if he reveals this to his neighbor's wife, then she might agree to have sex with him. Is he justified in doing this? I now, love this, the fact that he's the first Dear Abby or Anne Well, Landers. yeah, it sounds like it's yeah, a letter right. that might appear in Dear Abby today. Exactly. And, you know, he loved, I mean, he was very contemporary in a way. He realized that sex and crime stories sold newspapers and stuff, and he loved giving uh, moral advice. He wrote under the name of the casuist, which, you know, sort of means somebody who applies moral standards to our everyday life or maybe over-applies moral standards. You also say he stirred up an early abortion. Yeah, that's right. One of the letters that he made up uh, for the papers was abortion. But on this one, he sort of says, no, no, you know, two rights don't make a wrong, and et cetera. So he gives good advice. Uh, he said that, you know, that you, should, you shouldn't do things that would be wrong. But it's an amusing way, and it, it, it makes us relate to the times and realize these weren't all people on marble pedestals. And as for the abortion controversy, his rival, a rival newspaper in Philadelphia was serializing an encyclopedia. Now, that may sound boring, and here we are in the Philadelphia Inquirer building, and they only put out interesting papers. But back then, one of the papers thought that was a way to get readers in each. And so the first week, of course, it, it has the entry on abortion, which is, you know, alphabetical, and so it just did it. And Franklin pounces, and he writes from uh, pretending to be two different women. I think it was... Uh, Martha Careful and Celia Shortface, or whatever names he made up, wonderful names he made up. And they said they were shocked and outraged that uh, this newspaper would reveal and, and mess into the secrets of the fairer sex and that they were all going to uh, boycott this newspaper for having done so. His own newspaper. No, boycott the rival the newspaper because it was a rival newspaper that was serializing the mm. encyclopedia and done the abortion entry. And so it's Franklin pretending to be these two women writing. And it was sort of known. I mean, you know, it wasn't like he did it as a lie. Most of Franklin's uh, pseudonyms and uh, pseudonymous pieces, it was pretty upfront about it, like poor Richard and others, and some he wasn't. But um, so in that case, it was, I, in my mind, probably the first time the press stirred up, stirred up a bit of an abortion controversy in order to... Uh, be involved in a uh, circulation war. <laughs> now, in, in his newspaper, the Pennsylvania Gazette, did he do any what might today be considered normal news coverage? Oh, and yeah. Did, and did he take stands on political issues? Well, uh, he did normal news coverage. I mean, there was boring news, you know, sort of the dispatches from ships and which ships were coming in and arriving and letters from, he even had a partner, and when the partner decided to move, the partner would write letters from Virginia or the Carolinas, I can't remember, about farming. There were scientific papers and stuff like that. And he did, uh, as I said, some, you know, uh, gossip. He wrote under the name of the busybody for a while, and he always thought that gossip was good, although never malicious gossip. He was very careful about that. 
and a little bit of sex, a little bit of scandal, and a little bit of crime. Uh, you know, he has all, if you go, I love going to the old Pennsylvania Gazette. They're just tiny little items in the paper about somebody who had, uh, you know, got arrested for public drunkenness after berating his wife at the local, whatever it may be. And so it was a very popular newspaper. In terms of political views, he was generally quite moderate, and he helped establish a notion of a free press in America. Because in one of his very first editorials, Apology for Printers, in the Pennsylvania Gazette, he said, you're not going to like everything that gets printed in this newspaper because people's opinions are as diverse as their faces. And, uh, but if we only printed things that everybody liked, there'd be very little printed. So you have to realize that there'll be many opinions in this paper and that we are of the belief, our newspaper is, that when truth and falsity and all opinions and all sides have fair play, that the people are smart enough to come to their own opinions, and that's what a free press is all about. Now, you say in the book that in his autobiography, he uses the words industry and frugality 35 times. You know, well, let me explain that. One of the great things that has happened recently is all of Franklin's papers you can get in, I could get in digital form. They haven't been released yet, but somebody made a CD-ROM that took all what will be 47 volumes of his papers, each about 1,000 pages each. So huge amounts of papers, all digitized. So what, what you can do now is just you know, do the Google or word <laughs> search, and I can figure out how many times did he use frugality in industry. So I fear that the earlier biographers, if they wanted to do something like that, it would take them about you know, a year and a half to read everything he did and count the words. Did he live by his own advice? Or did he just throw sort out advice for other he people? He started as a tradesman and was very frugal and industrious. He, li he did not become aristocratic or try to live with great luxury. Uh, the running gag between himself and Deborah, his wife, a common-law wife here in Philadelphia, uh, both in Poor Richard's Almanac and in the letters, is how uh, she's a good, industrious, frugal helpmate. But every now and then, there's a taste for finery creeps in, and they buy a china bowl, or she buys a silver spoon for him to eat with. And he makes fun of that. Now, of course, all the advice he gives in uh, his paper or in uh, Poor Richard's Almanac, this early to bed and early to rise makes a man healthy, wealthy, and wise. Now, Franklin loves staying up late and stuff. And likewise, a penny saved is a penny earned. He never became uh, somebody who liked to display wealth. He never had a taste for real luxuries. However, he did love some good Madeira. He did collect good wines. He built himself a really nice house on Market Street. And he didn't live, uh, you know, he didn't take a vow of poverty, that's for sure. Did he smoke? Uh, not really, although, you know, pipe tobacco was sometimes used. There was smoking in his dining room uh, that he built in Philadelphia. But there's no record of him really being a smoker. Did he he did drink occasionally. Did he have a temper? Uh, he tried to keep it under control, and that was one of the virtues that he listed for himself as something he had to practice. He never really had a bad temper, and he was always able to keep silent. He used silence so much whenever he was enraged or somebody would try to provoke him. There were about eight or ten times in his life where I can go through it where he got provoked and he, you know, somewhat lost his temper, but he there's never, ever any record of any shouting match or him losing uh, control and anger. You said his common law wife, Deborah? Yeah, you know, he, he, when he comes to Philadelphia, he lands at Market Street and famously uh, straggles up there all wet and bedraggled with the three puffy rolls under his arm. And there's a girl, young girl, 12, 13, uh, standing in the doorway of Market Street laughing at him, thinking that he made a ridiculous appearance, as indeed he did, as he later admitted. And um, he doesn't think much of her, but he ends up uh, moving into her house because her, fa you know, her father becomes his landlord. And for a while they kind of courted, but then he goes off to England to be a printer there for a couple of years. And in the meantime, since he doesn't really write her, he's a little bit cold that way, she marries somebody else. And that person eventually runs away, or soon runs away, uh, disappears, absconds with uh, some property, and uh, never heard from again. So Franklin, uh, later, a few years later, having decided he didn't want a rich wife who would come with a dowry, because back then you could marry a richer woman and you'd have a dowry and would pay off your debts, he's played with that idea, but it didn't quite work, and he decided to marry Deborah, who he said, 
didn't, you know, wasn't rich, didn't come with a dowry, would, came with something more valuable than a dowry, which was that she was helpful and industrious and frugal, the, the attributes we talked about. But because she had been married and her husband had disappeared and the bigamy laws were so strict, uh, they decided it was safer to enter into a common law marriage without an official marriage in case her former husband reappeared. Was that considered scandalous at the time? No, it wasn't for some reason. I mean, I guess it was happened often enough. There were a lot of people poking fun at Franklin. He had an Ill illegitimate child right before this marriage, a common law marriage. And even that was not a huge scandal. Franklin took full responsibility for William the son, raised him, educated him, brought him into the household with Deborah, much to Deborah's annoyance at times. She expresses some annoyance. At That's a test of a marriage. A test of a it? marriage, bringing your uh, young, illegitimate baby into the house. Uh, but they got along, they rubbed along fine, pretty well. And occasionally, especially when Franklin was running for the assembly uh, later, you know, a decade or two later, uh, and there were some tough elections, they would dredge up the old scandals in the kitchen when she was supposedly William's mother and that sort of thing. But the notion of having a common law wife, uh, it, it did not hurt him or was considered that much of a scandal. How long were they married? Uh, that's a good question. They, uh, uh, I know that for the, she died in the, um, I think the late 1760s. Um, and uh, for they were apart most of the time. She hated to travel and said that they met on Market Street. She, her family had a house on Market Street. After they married, they rent a place on Market Street. Finally, they build the house. That's still part of Franklin Park there, or the at least skeleton of it, uh, on Market Street. So I don't think, as far as I can tell, she ever spent a night, not only away from Philadelphia, but away from Market Street. But for the last 17 years of their marriage, he was away 15 of those years, including when she died. He was in England as an envoy, and he kept wanting her to come to England, but she wasn't going to travel. She wouldn't even travel with him to Boston or Virginia. So it was a practical and pragmatic marriage, a partnership of convenience in many ways, but not a deeply romantic marriage. And you said he had a son, William. Mm -hmm. uh, grandchildren? Well, William uh, has his own illegitimate child, Temple Franklin while they're in England. And William, unlike his father, Benjamin, does not take this child in, does not raise him. Uh, so Benjamin Franklin soon takes responsibility for Temple, the beautiful young kid, the grandchild. The, you know, Franklin dotes on him, educates him, raises him in England. And in the meantime, William, uh, despite his father's wishes, had become rather aristocratic, you know, hanging around with the earls and the dukes becoming a Tory, becoming loyal to the crown. Soon becomes the royal governor of New Jersey and comes back to America from England where he had been with his father. And right in 1775, Benjamin Franklin comes home, taking with him Temple, this young, handsome, charming grandchild. And there's a summit meeting in Bucks County where uh, they struggle, William and Benjamin Franklin, because Benjamin wants his son William now to resign as the royal governor and to join the revolutionary cause for independence. William decides not to, and there's this great political split between the two men. And then there's a fight for the loyalty of this kid who gets, you know, the faith and loyalty of young Temple. And Temple ends up, as you may suspect, staying loyal to the grandfather rather than to his own father becomes part of the revolutionary movement, becomes Benjamin Franklin's secretary in Paris. And so the political struggle we had pulling apart from the mother country of England is reflected in this almost soap opera, poignant, wrenching tale of the personal division of loyalties within the family of Benjamin Franklin. Does Franklin have living descendants today? None from the William Temple line with the name Franklin. But he had a daughter, a wonderful daughter, named Sarah, called Sally, Sally Franklin. Marries somebody named Beish, Richard Beish. And uh, Franklin dotes on her, especially when he comes back here and his wife has died and he's in Philadelphia for the, for the, uh, for the Declaration of Independence and the Constitutional Convention. And she serves as his sort of, uh, takes care of him and takes care of the house. And Richard and Sally Franklin Beish 
live with Benjamin Franklin. And she has many children, one of whom, Benjamin Franklin Beige, was Ben Franklin's grandson, and took over the printing shop. And Franklin helped build him a publishing shop here, right, which is still there on Market Street in Philadelphia. And he published a great crusading newspaper called the American Aurora, which was Jeffersonian, democratic, you know, believed in democracy, against an imperial presidency. And John Adams, when he becomes president, this is after Franklin has died, uh, puts him in jail under the Alien and Sedition Acts for libeling President Adams. And uh, he ends up um, dying in prison as a pretty young guy, I think before he reached 30. Uh, we have not talked at all about Benjamin Franklin as an inventor, and we only have a couple minutes left, and we could spend easily an hour talking about those. Uh, but uh, the, you have a litany of things he's responsible for uh, proving that flying a kite was electricity, uh, the lightning rod, bifocal glasses, clean burning stoves, charts of the Gulf Stream, theories about the contagious nature of common colds. Uh, two things that he is credited somewhat with that I learned in the book are, uh, are daylight savings time and the matching grant. Well, first on daylight savings time, it was sort of a joke. As I said, he wasn't early to bed and early to rise. He loved staying up late night. So one night he's staying up all night in Paris playing chess and stuff. And it's a, it gets later and later and soon the candles sputter out. So he sends somebody out to get more candles. And they say, well, it's daylight. They open the windows. He said, so it is. It's so light. It's 7 in the morning. And he writes what's called an economical proposal, which is if we just shift the clocks, we could make use of all this light in the morning that we didn't know existed. I don't think it, it didn't directly lead to daylight savings, but it's sort of the idea thrown out there. Um, and uh, what was the other one? You Matching just grants. Matching grants, yeah, for the hospital in Philadelphia. Uh, he decides that the legislature gets them to appropriate 2,000 pounds on the condition that the citizens will match it with a 2,000 pounds worth of donation. And he said it helped leverage it. And this is great because it, it comes up with the idea that charity and volunteerism is important to our civic life, but it shouldn't be totally unrelated to government. That at times it helps to have a government framework, whether it's in something like Teach for America or AmeriCorps or those type of things or when we raise money for a hospital or create a volunteer fire department. So it's that idea of a public-private partnership and a matching grant that is so much like Franklin. But all of it, I mean, he has dozens of inventions, the lightning rod being by far the most important because uh, you forget how dangerous lightning was, how much destruction it caused, and there suddenly he snatched thunder from the gods and he's made our lives safer. While you were working on this book, were you always calling up friends or talking to people and saying uh, the latest Franklin story you had discovered? Oh, I think I bored my wife and my family, my daughter. What particular. were some of the things you dis discovered that you didn't know before? Uh, well, I first of all discovered that he was a truly great scientist, that it wasn't some old codger, you know, dabbling in flying kites and spouting maxims and stuff, that the single fluid theory of electricity is awesomely important. The depth of his diplomacy, I, I didn't know. I also didn't know the richness and texture of his life, how his being a scientist informed his political philosophy. And as you say, I mean, there are just so many tales and anecdotes, starting with, you know, him as a young kid and uh, learning and teaching himself how to write, to his deathbed and his fight against slavery and the, and the fights at the Constitutional Convention, that every time I'd read these and, and understand them, it just not only deepened my appreciation for Franklin, but these are wonderful tales. And that's what makes Franklin so interesting, is that they're anecdotes and tales and real life adventures and narrative you can talk about. It's not just some assessment or uh, you know, uh, analysis of a life. Now you mentioned earlier you were a journalist by trade? Yeah, I was at Time Magazine, and well, I started off at the Times Picayune of Stateside of New Orleans, worked for the London Sunday Times for a little while. Worked at Time Magazine for 20 years or so, and um, then CNN. Do you miss it? Yeah, I love journalism. I also think that it's important to, as Franklin did, at age, right in the point of his life, age 42. He's been a journalist, publisher, printer, media empire builder, and he retires from life. I mean, from his business, from his, and he sort of franchises it out because he wants to get involved in education in civic endeavors, maybe public life and discussion. His mother uh, is uh, somewhat baffled and says, why'd you do that? And he writes a wonderful letter saying, well, I'd rather have it be said of me 
that I lived usefully than that I died rich. Now, I have no presumption that I'm living usefully as well as Franklin did, but I do get inspired by the fact that, yes, if you've been in the media or you've been a journalist, but you have other things you want to do, that it's, it's you know, you should have, every now and then you get inspired and say, okay, I'm going to try doing something else. Your observation here in the book is he was graced and afflicted with the traits so common to journalists, especially the ones who have read Swift and Addison, who you referred to earlier, once too often, of wanting to participate in the world while also remaining a detached observer. When you're a journalist, do you feel like you have to stand outside of things? Yeah, when you're a journalist, you have to be a little bit detached. You're on the sidelines, and to use Teddy Roosevelt's phrase, you're on the sidelines rather than being in the arena. Now, there are times, and as, as a journalist, you really can be in the arena and be very involved for particular things that you have a passion for. But in general, journalists, writers, and I feel this about myself, one of the strengths and weaknesses is that you're always standing back a bit and you're watching from afar. Um, and that detached observer syndrome. And it makes you, if you're not careful, and maybe it made me, which is why I decided to try to be more careful, sometimes a bit jaded, sometimes a bit cynical. And I don't think most journalists today are, but some have become that way. And I felt a little of that in myself, that, uh, that, that, that detached observer role made you cynical at times, or snide, or, or and stuff. And I think Franklin worried about that as well. And what Franklin did was, and it was, it's sometimes a tension in people who write or people who are journalists, he wanted to observe. He was always kind of wry, standing back, amused a little bit. But he also wanted to be involved. He wanted to be a participant. And I think that was a bit of an attention in his life, especially until he retired from the print and publishing business. If you could talk to him today, what would you ask him? You know, um, first of all, I'm not, I think he'd be the one. He, he loved asking questions. And he would be absolutely fascinated by the way we live today. I mean, he's a very curious guy. He would want to know about the Blackberry. I might be using a Palm Pilot. He would want to know about the internet and compare it to the postal system in the open way. Anybody can send information to anybody they want to. I'm sure he would be wanting to know how he could set up a weblog or something, because that would be very Franklin-like. He also uh, was a very funny man. He could be telling jokes about Clinton's, you know, scandals or or worrying about George Bush's foreign policy or fiscal policies, that sort of thing, and he would be asking about that. But I think I would want to talk to him about his feel for American democracy and how it's progressed, because he really had a great fingertip feel for democracy. More than the other founders, he appreciated democracy. Some of them feared democracy, and were setting up all sorts of checks and balances to try to make sure we didn't have too much democracy. And Franklin was always saying, let's not put anything that would suppress the instincts of the common citizen. And, you know, he wanted direct election of judges, and he liked recall petitions, and he'd probably be amused by what's happening in California these days. So I, what we've done as a country since his time is expanded step by step in fits and starts the franchise, allowing the empowerment of more and more people in our democracy, women and then blacks and immigrants and others. And I would think he would be proud at the way democracy progressed because he believed that being tolerant of other people, tolerant of different types of people, was a key to democracy's success. He loved pluralism. He loved getting people together and, you know, of different stripes and sorts and finding common ground. And I think that he would feel that that's what makes our democracy magical, but that's also what's fragile. We have to preserve it. We're faced with a world of fanaticism and fundamentalism and attacks and tyranny from abroad. And he would be saying, you know, it's these values we're fighting for. We're out of time, although we could easily spend several more hours talking about this remarkable man, Benjamin Franklin, and American life. Walter Isaacson, thank you very much. Hey, thanks. It was great to be here. It's always fun to talk about Franklin in his hometown. You've been listening to a podcast of PA Books, a production of PCN, the Pennsylvania Cable Network. Full episodes of PA Books, as well as other PCN programs, are available to stream with the PCN app. Visit PCNTV.com or the App Store for details.